Hello, everyone. Uh, it's our pleasure today to have uh, Chris, uh, Chris Schaffhauser uh, from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Chris is going to talk about finite dimensional approximations of books. Yes, Chris, please. Sure. Thanks, Ali. And also, thanks, Peter, for the invitation to speak. I want to, like I said, I want to talk about a certain finite dimensional approximation property of uh, groups. Um, which is Blackner and Kirsberg's MF property. Um, MF stands for matricial field because there's some connection with continuous fields with matrix algebra fibers, but that won't actually show up. But um, anyway, throughout uh, G is a countable discrete group. Accountability is not actually important for any of the results, but um, it's convenient. Uh, there's general reductions to that case. Discreteness will be fundamental. And I want to consider the reduced group C star algebra. So I'll consider the first left regular representation of G on L2 of itself. And then the C star algebra, as you know, is. Close linear span. And probably one of the most well studied classes of C star algebras, do C star algebras coming from groups. And also um, the canonical trace on this all, no trace of G. So it's this. in terms of the representation, it's the state defined by the basis vector at one in G or I think this is finite linear combinations of group elements. It's finite many coefficients on zero. It's picking out the coefficient on one. So the approximation property and I should say there's competing definitions of what an MF group is in the literature. Uh, they're all of the same spirit. It's not clear how they're actually related. Um, this is probably the strongest reasonable definition I'm going to give. That's the pro property I really want to consider. So there's a uh, adjoint preserving linear maps from the reduced group algebra to possibly, well, typically very large matrices um, of dimension D of N with some integers. So that I want them to be behave like star homomorphisms in the limit. So Pn of A B minus Pn of A. Pn of B goes to zero for all A and B in the group brain. And also they preserve the trace in the limit. So I take the trace of Pn of some A. In the limit, I get the trace of A. The trace on the matrices is a normalized one. Um, so trace of the unit is scaled to be one. So in limit, you have finite dimensional representations of a group in some sense. If you'd like, you could all ask linearity and adjoint preserving held on the nose, but if you'd like, you could ask those asymptotically as well. And if, would be the same condition. Convenient to just take them to be linear to start with. Right. So put this one down here. I, I'm not assuming the maps VN are bounded. They 
very well could be unbounded linear maps. Even though they're everywhere to find unbounded linear maps. But it turns out you can prove. Um, this was done by in slightly different form by Higson and Kasparov that they're asymptotically bounded uh, and asymptotically contractive even. Yeah. Good example and good non-example. Yeah, I'll get to that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just say quickly where this is coming from is that so mysterious. So um, for any A, you have, well, it's a C star algebra, A star A is smaller than the norm squared. And I can write the order algebraic, purely algebraically is asking there's some B where I add on a B star B exactly that and you apply phi ends you approximately preserve multiplication you get phi n of a absolute value squared plus phi n of b absolute value squared is close to norm a squared and in particular phi n of a norm squared is only below norm of a squared plus epsilon or something and it's on the limit you get the right thing um okay and you know, get to the examples. Just, just one second here. I'll, the other thing I want to point out: it's yeah, you know, if you don't, you know, typically when you build representations of C star algebras, you can't prove that you know you have star morphisms are automatically contractive, but in practice, you're, the morphism you're building is usually densely defined. You have to extend it, so you have to prove continuity anyway. If you have a if you if these VNs are say only defined on the algebraic span of the group, so it's a complex group brain. And you assume one, two, and also this asymptotic boundedness condition, they do extend by continuity. These VNs do extend by continuity in some sense to give representations of the completion. Um, right. so, yeah, you have a trace between embedding into normal power, I feel like it's the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there will be ultra powers at some point. You don't need them. <laughs> yeah, so you do need to prove that before you can put in an ultra power. Um, yeah, it's the, the third one is what justifies the ultra power picture. Right. So getting towards examples, so and one thing. Any MF group is uh maybe the more slightly more familiar property is is a hyperlinear group. Oh, it's just like G embedding the unitary group of R omega. Um where the group one I mean algebra satisfies constant embedding problem. Uh, Basically, the putting in embedding the R omega is the same as asking second condition and the first, but in the normalized two norm instead of the operator norm. But I just took a two there, which would become hyperlinear. And, well, I'd also have to explicitly ask for a third condition. You couldn't prove it, you couldn't prove the boundedness anymore if you were only. Doing this in two norm, but yeah. The hyperlinear is formally a weaker condition. Um, but so very famous open problem are all groups hyperlinear. Um, I think the general consensus is it should be null, but no one knows where to find this group or what the obstruction is. Um, Yeah. 
It it does with some trickery. It's uh you I think it's a tensor product if so if I could do it in a way it sends all the group elements the things to trace zero, then it does. And you can start tacking on infinite tensor powers and drive the trace down to zero. Um so it's important to our our omega there. If you try to do it with MF, that actually doesn't work. Um but is, it, is this property related to uh um it's not clear. Um, I mean, I don't, neither implication is known. It's definitely in the same spirit as specificity, but. I guess he has questions. Do I have a non example? The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's, if you change a problem in that a group algebra, but just a C star algebra of the faithful trace, can you do the same thing? The answer is no, but the only counter example we know are the counter examples of the kind of bedding problem. So there's, if you ask us for a property of a C star algebra and a trace, if it's, if that's MF, then the traceable von Neumann algebra generates embeds into R omega. Um, Okay, but I want some actual examples. So the the only really trivial examples are finite groups where left regular representation is your finite dimensional approximation. Um, but a little bit of work can get into somewhat more interesting groups um, when it's maybe but illustrative is take the integers. Um, so I'll take unitary representations of the group, say in the n by n matrices. But the generator is going to go to the, just the permutation matrix. So you end up some integer k is the cyclic shift of order k. You can extend these, so those are actually group homomorphisms. And um, have so I take the trace of UN of K, it's zero for all. You fix that large enough, all the all the K you end up K's have trace zero except for the identity. And you ends extend linearly to the group ring. And The first condition holds because I mean the PNs are actually group homomorphic are actually star homomorphisms. The trace condition holds because of this. Eventually all the k's go to the things of trace zero. The trace is linear, so the extent. And the right. so you get the first two conditions. And because I'm not actually on Defined on the whole group algebra at this point, to find a dense subalgebra to extend to C star of Z, I need the a boundedness condition too. But if, if I look at the limb soup, say for all A and group ring. If I apply phi n of a and take the norm, I get some norm on the, that is a, a norm on the group ring, C star norm, in fact. 
And it's always going to, because of the trace presenting condition, it's always bigger than the norm in the left regular representation. Lambda there. And because it's a norm on the group algebra, it's always smaller than the norm in the universal representation. Then on the integers, there's you know, the full and reduced group algebras agree. So that happens automatically. The, As you can just stare at the proof. It's not hard to push this a little bit farther. You really need, I mean, that came from amenability. The first one came from having sufficiently many finite dimensional representations to get the trace condition. So, ask say that Z is residually finite and amenable. Then she is MF. So you want to know there exists um, a decreasing sequence of normal subgroups of G, trivial intersection. each each nk is a normal subgroup of g and uh, a finite index So the, where the unitary representation is going to come from, I'm going to take G, map it to the map it onto the quotient by say the kth group out kth normal subgroup, and then take the left regular representation at lambda k of that. And since it's a finite index, that is a, just a finite dimensional Hilbert space. This is um, MD for some D, or I guess D is the index. Um, that composition is my, I guess I switched from Ns to Ks for some reason, is these UKs. It, it will satisfy the so they're all homomorphisms. So first condition is true without the epsilons. If given any, any group element that's not the identity, then it'll be you know, non-zero and some large enough quotient. And then have trace zero in the left regular representation. So all the non-trivial group elements eventually are mapped to things to trace zero. This is what's going to force the second condition. And then the bound is this you need to extend to the completion of the group brain comes from amenability, which I assumed. Residually finite amenable groups. The probably one of the most famous ones, the, the Heisen, integer Heisenberg group on three generators. Um,
it's amenable because it, let's see, I think it's, that's a normal subgroup and the quotient is Z. So it's extension of Z squared, Z by Z squared or vice versa. Um, and residually finite, well, your finite quotients are just given by taking things modulo N. <laughs> Is MF. Um, more generally, if you have a subgroup of upper triangular matrices over some with ones on the diagonal in some or over some commutative brain, it's also MF. So it's a very classical theorem of Mosev, combinatorial group theory, that if, if you have a finitely generated subgroup of GLNK, upper triangular or not, it's residually finite. And the fact that it's upper triangular is what lets you verify amenability. I guess you have finitely generated G of this form or MF, but then you can extend from there. Um, There's I'm getting close to what the examples you can do without too much work, um, and the ones I'll be able to prove for you. There's a few easy permanence properties you get. Um, so it, it's a hereditary property. I mean, it passes the subgroups. Take the same representations and restrict them to a subgroup. It's a Local property, if G is an increasing union of MF subgroups and G itself is MF, um, that's standard. You read it in terms of finite sets and epsilons, and your finite set, finite set of things in the group brain lived in some matrix, lived in some finitely generated subgroup of G. If that was MF, then you're done. <laughs> um, and it's a virtual property. Uh, if you have a finite, if you have a, if G contains a subgroup, MF subgroup, a finite index, and G was MF. The idea is if, well, in general, you have a unitary representation of some subgroup of G, you get an induced representation of the big group. If it was a subgroup of finite index, the induced representation, if the finite dimensional representation of a subgroup of finite index, the induced representation will still be finite dimensional. And if you're careful, you can, gets kind of induced approximate representations of the subgroup as well. And permanence property which takes a little bit more work. If G and H are MF and one of them is exact, which well, covers all the groups I know how to write down anyway. Um, there are non-exact groups I don't understand. And the product, direct product is MF. I have no idea if exactness is necessary. Basically, you want to take tensor products of the finite dimensional representations, and you need exactness to make the norms work out correctly at some point in the proof. Tim Raynone and I proved this in a paper from about 2015 or 2016, and we found out a while later it was in literature at least three or four places earlier than that. But it's with all the same proof each time. It's uh, not all that hard to show. It's Okay. 
continue this list of examples here, but now it gets into the very difficult theorems and not simple facts. Um, first one, I mean, the first really non-trivial example was Horup and uh, Thorgrenson. Um, free groups. A rather remarkable fact. It's the uh, first think what you would do, it's say it's a free group on two generators for completeness. You have to build you know, a lot of finite dimensional representations. Of, if you want to represent the free group somewhere, you just choose two unitaries and the generators there. That gives you is MF property on on the group ring before you complete to a C star algebra. Question is, how do you choose their, where to send the generator so that the norm condition holds? And no one knows how to write down these, where to send these unitaries, but what Arp and Dobrinson show is that with, if you choose the unitaries at random with high probability that estimate holds in the limit. So in particular, there exists a choice, finite dimensional representations. Um, Other huge results, amenable groups fall in this class. Um, I mean, this is sort of different. The third one is comes for free, the same way it did for the integers. It's the this is going to be some norm on the group algebra. It has to be the reduced norm because it's between the reduced and max. Uh, the really hard part is just getting finite approximate finite dimensional representations of the group to start with. Um, that's actually the whole problem, essentially. And we should at least mention you also need the Higgs and Kasparov solution to the bomb con conjecture for amenable groups to run this. It's the quasi diagonality theorem has a UCT assumption that's coming from bomb con machinery in the case of group algebras. Okay, and there's a there's a few more that came after using some combination of these theorems. Uh, I won't write down, but Ben Hayes showed how to modify the the proof of this to show free products of MF groups are MF. You know, the free group is free product of the integers with itself, um, but more generally, it's free products of any two MF groups are MF. Um, there's Tim Raynon and I showed uh, if you take a semi direct product of an amenable group by a free group, that's also MF using um, well, nearly the full strength of the classification theorem. And this cross product construction of um, Ozawa, Rodeman Sakai, or sorry, Ozawa, Rodeman Sato. Um, and okay. two. So some very, very recent results. Um, there's, didn't get the authors right. Uh, there's, I probably pronounced that, Loader or, and uh, Michael Maggie, it's on archive in 22. Um, prove this property for what are called limit groups with a certain amount of free, some kind of freeness condition. Um, and maybe a more familiar class for all any closed um, two manifold, the fundamental, so the surface groups are MF. I'm suggesting a false statement here that not all surface groups are actually limit groups. There's three exceptional ones, but the 
Um, service groups are limited groups with three exceptions, but the exceptional ones you can prove by hand or MF. Um, I'm, two of the exceptions are Zmod2 and Z cross Zmod2. And the third one is an index two subgroup. The third one I think is if you take um, three copies of uh, RP2, it's it's not actually a limit group because there's still CMOD2 torsion in it, but there's a, you know, it's, it has an index two cover by you know, a torus or something, or by probably a two hold torus. So it's virtually a limit group and that's good enough. Um, the, okay. And just the last one before I, and, uh, Maggie and uh, Thomas from, I'll say about July, um, got right angle learning groups. That's if you take a finite graph, take one generator for each vertex and add the relations that two generators commute when the vertices are adjacent. Um, you get this, these right angle darken groups. So if it's a complete graph, you're back to you know the free abelian group. If it's a empty graph, you have sort of no edges. It's a free group. So they're somehow interpolating between free abelian groups and free groups. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, one way or another, it goes back to the Hubbard, R. P. Arvinson type things and, and refinements of that. I mean, basically, these are the only tools we have still. Um, clever uses of those and or bells and whistles added to them. Because roughly what the limit groups are, so this is going to be slightly imprecise, but you take the collection of all finitely generated groups with with a choice with the distinguished choice of generating sets. You can put a compact Hausdorff topology on that um, space, and the limit groups are the limit points of the free groups inside that space. Um, so in some very weak sense, there are limits of free groups. which is somehow just, I mean, it's a long and difficult paper, but it somehow gives just enough freeness to run these free probability type arguments. Okay, we're, wait. reason I got interested in this more recently was a conjecture that Ben Hayes made at a, a problem session in, um, BAMP. Actually, this would have been the logic and operator algebra BAMP one meeting. Yeah. That if G and H are MF and okay. being a little bit sloppy with notation here, say A is some common subgroup of both G and H. And A is amenable. So the uh, the amalgamated product is MF. So where conjecture is coming from. Is if you replace MF with say hyperlinearity, so you're asking for the two norm approximate representations instead of operator norm approximate representations. This is true. Um, amalgamated products of 
hyperlinear groups over amenable subgroups are hyperlinear. And also, if you change it to Solfec, where you ask for approximate representations on symmetric groups, the approximations of the Hamming distance, it is true. Amalgamated products of Solfec groups over an amenable subgroup are still Solfec. So I mean, it's at least, I mean, it's a more rigid approximation property, but it's definitely in the same spirit as I mean, hyperlinearity or sophisticity. Um, Sorry, I don't quite understand the assumption A is amenable. I mean, uh, how, how non-trivial do they have to be? It's not uh, just more than one element. If it's one element, it's, uh, it is true. Oh, I, uh, Any amenable. Sorry, A is a group here, but yeah. It's one of yeah. It's one of the elements, and it's just the three products, right? Yes. So, and that was different for yeah, I think I didn't write that down, but yeah, I mentioned it just out loud, but it is as a result of Ben that it's true. No, I said it out loud, but yeah, here it is now. It's it's true when A is the trivial group, so free products of MF groups will be MF. I don't know for sure, but I, it's possible if A is finite, you might be able to just do this by hand. Um, I haven't... I probably tried it at some point. I can't remember. Um, the, but anyway, the. It's still, uh, why is amenable the, the um, critical assumption? I mean, after all, the three groups are in it, so what if A is three? Well, the G and H are, aren't required to be amenable. It's just the thing you're amalgamating over. Yeah. I mean, even the hyperlinear setting, this is the generality we know this in. Um, the, it, it, I guess it could be true you take any two, say, hyperlinear groups amalgamated over some common subgroup, which is necessarily hyperlinear, then, then the, the whole thing's hyperlinear, but we don't know it even in that setting. Um, we know it for amenable. In the hyperlinear setting, we know it for amenable amalgams. But men's conjecture is still open, but um, there's a, a very partial solution, which gives it some hope. So this is on the archive um, from a few months ago. Uh, if I strengthen it to not just ask for two MF groups, but ask for two amenable groups. And not just for a common subgroup, but for a common normal subgroup. Then it's true. I mean, the normality of the amalgam is a rather restrictive condition, but it's what I can prove. Well, In the, you know, the last 10 minutes or so I have left, I'll try to give some flavor of where this is coming from. There's, so I mean, there is a standard, there's a natural strategy to this or even the full conjecture where you know, if you, you know, forget about all the epsilons, you, you want to build a map of the amalgamated product, you put G and H into something in a way that they coincide on A, 
and then that gives you a map. So what you want to do is somehow, and you can do this if you're lucky and the, and the approximations work out correctly, you know, it would be enough to find finance dimensional approximations of both G and H on, of the same dimension, which approximately coincide on the subgroup A, and then try to put it together and get an approximate map out of this, and just hope that it approximately contains the left regular representation and does the right thing on trace, or somehow modify it to have those properties. Um, and that's kind of, I mean, that's what happens in the hyperlinear case. I and mean, the over simplified version of this is you put, in the hyperlinear setting, you put G approximately into matrices, H approximately into matrices of the same dimension. Now you have two approximate representations of this amenable group into matrices, and you show you can approximately conjugate one to the other. So that you build the things independently and up to unitary equivalence, they necessarily coincide on A, at least up to an epsilon. So they conjugate the representation of H so it extends the, so that H and G both restrict the representation of A and then put it together. And that's the game I'm going to play here. Um, but, you know, we have, even if you take groups where we have a very good understanding of what their finite dimensional representations look like, their, the approximate finite dimensional representations can be very complicated. Like if you take G to be, you know, Z squared, you know exactly what its representation theory is. Approximate representations of z squared are pairs of almost commuting unitaries, which is already very complicated for one of the simplest groups you can write down. So yeah, understanding what the approximate representations look like to even have a chance of mimicking writing that strategy is going to take, take something. Um, and So um, actually, before I say a theorem, I need some notation. So I'm not going to look at representations, as, at finite dimensional approximate representations, but something very close. I'm going to replace the matrices with UHF algebra. But take the infinite tensor of the matrices, so it's the UHF algebra where each prime occurs with infinite multiplicity. <laughs> and it has a trace coming from the trace of the matrices. So the For G amenable, also still assumed to be countable. Uh, there exists a, a group representation on, on Q. Not approximate, but a genuine one. Which is trace preserving on the group algebra. Mention this also depends on a large collection of results from the bomb con literature that um, there's, you know, my theorem it is really if you have a nuclear C algebra faith, with a faithful trace and the UCT holds, then you get an embedding into the NEAF algebra where the K0 groups make sense. Um, so the UCT is again coming from the Higgs and Kasparov solution, the bomb con conjecture for amenable groups. And then a theorem of Luke that when the bomb con conjecture holds computes the range of the gives upper bound at least on the range of the trace on K0 of the group algebra. It turns out if you have a group satisfying the bomb con conjecture, all the projections in the group algebra are of rational trace. Um, 
which is so you at least get a k0 map in, from the group algebra to the rationals and then the machine i built is enough to lift that implement that by a star homomorphism and you get a little bit more and it was unique up to approximate unitary equivalence so if you give me another v there's a sequence of unitaries Pointwise in the limit conjugate the U's close to the V's. So how do you put it together? In the sign of this theorem, G and H are now amenable with a common normal subgroup. I choose, now let's say UG. You can put both G and H onto universal UHF, represent both G and H on the universal UHF algebra in this trace compatible way. So all the non-zero, or all the non-trivial group elements go to trace zero elements of Q. We say trace preserving because that's what it means at the when you extend linearly to the group ring. And when I restrict both representations to A, I have two trace preserving representations of A on the UHF algebra. So they're approximately neutral equivalent. Um, so we're calling here's a W and say the norm ultra power of Q with U is the unitary conjugate of um these now are representations on um not Q, but it's ultra power. Um, H. And then I have two re representations of G and H that coincide on this common subgroup A. They give me a unitary representation of the amalgamated product. So if you start unwinding, I at least have finite dimensional approximate representations from this amalgamated product of matrices. Um, because I can we'll get, get them to Q and then take an expectation onto a large enough matrix subalgebra. Both the second and third conditions are going to fail. They're, they're not going to be trace preserving, except for on elements in A and uh, in subgroup A. And they're not going to extend to the reduced group algebra. There's a lack of bounded. There's unbound. They won't be bound, bounded by the left regular representation. But what you can do, I have a unitary representation of this group on some C star algebra. It does extend to the full group C star algebra. Not you anymore, just you omega. And to correct for the extra information, I can, um, I'm going to tensor on um, the reduced C star algebra of the quotient. Which is the, I mean, here's where normality enters. Maybe I'll quotient by A. And what you do, okay, so it's the obvious thing. You send a group element to wherever you sent that group element, tensor it, um, let's say Q, or Q is the quotient for, uh, by A. Maybe lambda sub QA.
Okay. And there's a little computation here, but it's not terribly hard to check. Once you tensor on that copy of the group reduced group algebra of the quotient, it does actually factor through the reduced group algebra um, and is trace preserving. And then in the paper, I put over on the properties of ultra powers, but what's really, what you've really done now is you've taken this thing, reduced group algebra, approximately embedded it into large matrices over this other group algebra. This G and H are amenable, so the quotients are amenable. By decreases by Venter theorem, the, these quotients are MF. And by Hayes' extension of the Hallerup Jorgensen theorem, the free product is MF. So that thing is an MF group. Um, somewhere in here in the details, you actually use a result of Dijkman Schlechtank. So Tenko as well, that free products of exact groups are exact. Um, but no. in the end, it works. And you take you bit, um, the representation, approximate representations of that, of this MF group, take matrix amplifications of them, and you'll get in the composition, if you choose your quantifiers carefully, so you have finite matrices of this MF approximations of this thing by just composing the two approximate representations. Um, so you end up with the group as MF, but yeah, I should stop there. Thank you.